Hey guys, congratulate me. I can breathe through my nose again. Fashion design process video number three. Today's topic will be color and texture. Okay, we're gonna talk about color mostly. We're gonna touch on texture development and experimentation. We're not gonna talk about fabrics too much in this video because I have a whole video's worth of things to say about fabric. So I've been teaching color theory for a few years now and I know that students are reluctant to take classes where they don't see a direct fashion connection, okay? Students who hate sewing, they'll still take sewing classes because they understand its application. And, you know, students who hate sketching, they still take sketching classes because they understand its application. But when you have something that seems more indirect, like color theory, you know, students don't want to take it at all. I don't recommend color theory to students because I teach it. I teach it because I find it an important thing to study for fashion students. And, you know, you see color theory in action all around the world. And if you pay attention, you'll be able to spot how they put those colors together instead of just looking at it and being like, wow, that's nice. I wonder how they put that together. So if you have a color theory class in your school or if you can take a summer class somewhere else, you know, I highly encourage you do so. So I'm going to give you guys like the tiniest bit of color theory lessons today as it applies to how we're going to put our color story together for our collection. First of all, what is color? Color is comprised of three things, value, saturation, and temperature. Value means the lightness or the darkness of a color. So if you have, you can have light reds and you can have dark reds. And if someone says, let's play around with different values of red, that means that in addition to whatever you guys are working on, you want, they want to see it with some light reds and some darker reds. Light values are also called high values and dark values are also called low values. And then middle, the middle is the middle. Saturation is the brightness or intensity of a color. Now, brightness has nothing to do with lightness. Lightness, light colors are what colors with a lot of white in them. You know, banana yellow, baby blue. Brightness is about the saturation of a color. How red is it? Is it the purest possible red or is there anything in there that is muddying the red at all? Okay. Is it red, 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 or is it a yellow red, a blue red, a shade of a red, you know, kind of dulled down red, or is it just purely intense red at saturation? Okay. And all those are different colors. You have fully saturated red. That's just one color. And then you have a little desaturated red and a little bit more desaturated red, and you keep desaturating until you end up with a neutral, right? Now, there are four main and best ways to desaturate a color. Number one, you can tint a color by adding white. If you add white to red, you'll end up with salmons and corals. Add more white, you'll end up with more like peachy pinks. Number two, you can shade a color by adding black. So adding black to your red, you'll end up with burgundies and blood reds, things like that. Number three, you can tone a color by adding gray. And you can add a light gray for duller, lighter reds, and you can add a dark gray for duller, darker reds. The fourth way is to mute a color by using the opposite in the color wheel. The opposite of red in a color wheel is green. So here I added a little bit of green. So you get a dull brownish red. And then here I added a lot more green and so you're getting just even duller looking red, right? This color in here is like you know, that's more of like a brick red maroon color. And in here, it's looking like kind of a dull purpley tone, right? Temperature, that is the warmness or coolness of a color. You know, you have red, orange, and yellow. Those are your basic warm colors. You have green and blue and purple as your basic cool colors. And, you know, you can take a color like red and you can add a little yellow to it and you'll end up with a warm tone red. Or you could take the same red and add a little blue to it and you'll end up with a cool tone red. When you are working on your collection, 
If you have a collection where you have a lot of black and you have some blues and purples, you have this whole cool color story going on and you're talking to your team or you're talking to your teacher, your boss, and you're like, you know, let's, let's throw in an accent color, something that really makes things pop. And someone says, hey, what about red? Would you use a warm tone red or a cool tone red? You would use a cool tone red because it has it shares a blue undertone with the rest of your colors. And so while because it's red, it still pops, it still has the same undertone family. Okay. Whereas if you put in a warm tone red in there, it's very jarring, has nothing in common with all the other colors, and it would just stick out. One of the most important takeaways with color and design is all colors look different according to what color is paired next to it. When you look at these two burgundies, which color looks darker? This one or this one? You see how this one looks slightly darker because it's next to this much lighter color? And because this burgundy is paired next to such a darker color, it looks lighter in comparison. Also, do you see how this burgundy looks cooler than this burgundy because this burgundy is next to such a warm color okay the contrast between the two makes this burgundy look darker and cooler than this burgundy even though it's the same freaking burgundy and that is so important when you're putting your colors together let's say you're at the fabric store and you come across this amazing red fabric and you're like oh this is the best. I want everything in this color. I want lipstick in this color. I want sure. shoes. And then you bring that fabric home and you have all your fabric board set up and then you add this red to it and all of a sudden everything just looks like crap. And you're like, what? What happened? Maybe the red just doesn't go. Okay. There are a lot of different, there can be a lot of different reasons why that would happen. But, and it doesn't mean you have to let go of the idea of red completely. Maybe you need a duller red. Maybe you need a warmer red, a cooler red, a brighter red, whatever. But it's not about the individual colors, but how they work together. Okay. I mean, of course, it's about the individual color because most people don't buy the whole collection. But if you're looking through the lookbook and the red looks out of place with everything else, it's very jarring. You have to get all these individual awesome colors to also work together harmoniously. You're like, Zoe, easier said than done. I know. What are we made of? Not magic, but practice. We are made of practice, not magic. All this background information to get the ball rolling on putting together a color story for your collection. Number one, do you want color for your collection? Okay. There are exceptions always. You know, there are some designers who don't work with a lot of colors. Designers like Anne de Millimeester and Alexander Wang, they work with a lot of black and white, you know, and that's their prerogative. That's their, that's their brand's aesthetic. And that is what we've come to expect from them. Okay. We do not expect, you know, a rainbow color collection from Anne de Millimeester. Like her version of color is like military green. Right. And if you watch a Yoshi Yamamoto show and it's not 85 percent black, I'm assuming he's dead and someone else took over and I missed the news announcement. OK, because, you know, he is like all black and moody and drapey and all about cuts and proportions and not about color. Okay. Karl Lagerfeld, he does a lot of work with black and white because that is the Chanel brand legacy from Coco Chanel herself, okay? So if it's part of the aesthetic, if it's part of the brand that you not work with a lot of color, that is one decision. On the other hand, you know, for the most of us, we are working with creating an interesting and cohesive and intriguing, enticing color story that works with our brand, that works with, you know, our current collections, mood and concepts and inspiration you know, and colors that work well together so that when all the models come out on the runway at the end of the show, the whole collection looks good together because all the colors look good together. Because that is the first thing you notice about design. Okay? When you walk into a store, before you can even get up close and notice that, oh, those buttons are so cool, or this collar makes my neck look super skinny, or anything, you notice the dots of color, the sea of color.
you know, and everyone has favorite colors they like to wear. And so they just gravitate towards that when you're shopping. And so whether your aesthetic is super avant-garde, comme des garçons, or, you know, I like very clean, wearable things and I only shop for basics at Uniqlo, doesn't matter, you're going to gravitate towards the colors that you like. Okay, so you can do a bright red comme des garçons or you can do a bright red Uniqlo, but if you like red, you're going to gravitate towards red before you start picking apart the design. So color is your first impression and you know what they say about first impressions. When was the last time you bought a jacket that fit you that the design was cool, but the color was totally not what you wanted? Give me a break. You don't even know if that jacket fits you right because you didn't try it on because the color was so awful. You're like, mm -mm, I don't want that. I don't wear orange. Do I want to look like a construction cone? No, I do not. And so you just walk right by it and you don't even know if it fits you like a dream or not. So number one, make a decision. Am I someone who doesn't play around with color at all? Or am I someone like Rick Owens who does mostly neutrals, but every once in a while throws in a color? Like this season, he did a bunch of mint green and brown and you're like, like who expected mint green at Rick Owens? You know, that's Rick Owens version of like trouncing around in a rainbow skirt. It's like, wow, that's super colorful for Rick Owens. Or you can be someone who's super colorful, is known for their use of color. Like you go to an Oscar de la Renta show and you expect, you know, a parade of really sumptuous, gorgeous colors. So everyone is entitled to their own opinions, of course, on what looks good. But for me, the best color stories have a good balance of neutrals and brighter colors and a good balance of light colors and dark colors. You know, good color stories, they feature a bunch of really wearable colors and a few colors that are more on trend and a little harder to wear, but you know, you need to keep things fresh and new. If you have just like all pastels, people's eyes just start kind of glazing over and you need like a few, you know, breaks of dark and medium colors so that the pastels look fresh and new every time you see a new outfit. And if you have everything being blue on the runway, you know, people will kind of get lost in this blue haze. And if that's the effect you're going for editorially on the runway, that's great. But once you get down to your lookbook and the pieces you're actually going to sell, you're gonna have to offer a more varied palette than just a series of blues. When you're selecting your colors, I want you to consider a few things. Number one, what season are you designing for? Brown can work at any season, okay? The same brown can work in spring or in fall. But how about brown with orange and red and gold and touches of hunter green? What season does that feel like to you? Number two, who is your muse and customer? What colors are they wearing? What colors do they feel good in? Does your muse wear a lot of banana yellow and periwinkle together? I don't know, you tell me, it's your muse. Number three. <coughs> <coughs> Coughing is exhausting, ah. Number three, consider color psychology and the mood you're trying to convey. In my previous video, we talked a lot about death and decay and blood and the ugly side of glamour. And, you know, these are the concepts that I was playing with and, you know, chicken scales and feathers and stuff. What colors do you associate with these concepts? Do you expect a lot of, you know, bright yellow and fresh grass green and vibrant orange? Or are you expecting more dirty burgundies and grazy yellows and blacks? Right? What kind of mood are you trying to convey? You know, how does color psychology tap into it? Well, people automatically assume black is for death, red, burgundy, they look like blood. And so the passion, the violence, you know, all those things that people associate with those colors come together to really convey that mood. You don't have to be so literal, however, like maybe your colors are more like dirt brown and like the dirty brownish neutrals of leaves that have fallen on the grass and, you know, like that kind of thing that shows more like fall turning into winter, you know, without the violence of red. So you can interpret this, these concepts of death and decay in different ways. So because color is such a huge portion of how we view a whole collection, you know, the colors that you pick should represent the collection's mood. 
I like to lift my color story from images that I collected in my visual research. And these are some of the options that I was playing around with. Now, if I were doing, if I were continuing my sketchbook development, I would trim these images and I would actually put them right in my book. First of all, I love this graffiti page. Like I had a few pages from that magazine I was looking at and this one had a beautiful combination of these brownish blacks and then these dried blood browns and then it had these really sickly yellow greens that worked really well together they had some neutrals and some colors and they looked really exciting with the contrast and they work with my theme i had mentioned in my previous video how much i like these colors together where it's beautiful vibrant colors but everything is dulled down some you know i love this concept of you know after a death in your life everything feels like everything's a little bit duller. I love the colors and textures going on in this picture. These these are mining pits. There's a life here. It's just all rocks, but there's so many beautiful colors of rocks. And then you remember my Extraordinary Chickens book and how obsessed I am with that? I put this image from my Extraordinary Chickens book of the eggs. I sort of fell in love with this color palette. I know, I was getting really kind of morbid and everything, and I was just playing around with this whole like not quite alive concept of these eggs. Pull your image or images, it can be a combination of two, and start pulling together your colors. And you could do a few different things. You could take out your paints and you can start mixing colors. You can take your markers and start matching up the colors according to what you see in your picture. Like that's a good match for this background color. You know, here are some of the darker egg colors, some of the lighter brown egg colors. There's a lot of black in the shadows there. There is that little blue chicken egg. And this one is like more pinkish. So make some color chips out of marker, out of paint, out of color pencil. No matter what you do, I highly recommend that you make all your color chips in one medium so that you're not confused with the colors because some of them are in color pencil and have this texture and some of them are in marker and have this other texture. It's like they should all have just like the flat texture so that you're really just concentrating on the color. Another thing you could do is to pick up paint chips at the hardware store. Now, these are free, but you guys just be respectful and don't go crazy, okay? Because these are for people who are trying to figure out how to paint their house, and they're for customers who are going to buy paint later. Once I've actually really finalized what kind of colors that I want, then I would go and try to get paint chips for the colors to put in my final color story for my sketchbook development. No matter what you're doing, Make sure that you're playing with your colors in really bright light, a preferably sunny daylight or, you know, really bright, white, clean light. Now, once you've figured out your colors, okay, make large color chips, you know, this size or smaller with your markers, with your paints, whatever, because you're going to cut them up so that you can play with color proportions. Let's say I really love these three colors and I want to play with these. I've cut these up in different sizes so that I can play with color proportions. Just by playing with the different proportions of just three colors, you're going to get really different looks. This one is heavy on the olive drab. This one just uses burgundy as a accent pop. This one is really heavy on the cool tone colors and the lightest color is just a pop. So this is a really heavy color story. And this one is a really warm color story with its dingy red and dingy yellow green with like a pop of this cooler blue green. Okay. So you're creating different colors by using different proportions of color. If you watch the first video, then you will remember how I talked about how color proportions really change the mood of a collection. Think about the usage of black, okay, and in its different proportions. Okay? Black is a super popular color. Almost every designer uses it in at least some 
amount. You can go full Yoshi Yamamoto on the black and just be like, it's a sea of black, lots of black, funeral dirges, beautiful cuts and drapes. Everything is very moody and dramatic. You can go flirty goth black like Anna Sui. Anna Sui features tons of black. Her cosmetics collection packaging is black, but she has liberal doses of pinks and purples and just fun, flirty, feminine colors that prevents it from getting too heavy, right? It's definitely got that, you know, little gothic Lolita touches to it and everything. Or you could swing the complete opposite end of the spectrum and go like Carolina Carrera. Did I just say Carolina Carrera? I meant Carolina Herrera. Carolina Herrera le levels of black, where black is just an accent, okay? And really, colors are like yellow and red and orange and color is magic and beautiful. And it's amazing as the ability to breathe through your nose. And so black is just a touch, okay? So everyone using black is using it in different proportions. So you need to figure out your color proportions. You know, if I use this color story, but I use it predominantly white and baby blue and baby pink, that's a real springy, light, you know, airy sort of color story. If I use a lot of browns and blacks and this background kind of grayish lavender color, then that feels more fall, that feels more sedate, more subtle, more deep, more grounded, right? And so same color story, different proportions, completely different outcomes. When I am putting my sketchbook together, I like to keep my color story and my color proportions pages separate so that I'm playing with them independent of each other. Okay. You have your color story, you know, maybe you finalized it like 99%. And then in the subsequent pages, you play with the proportions over and over again until you get the effect that you want. Next, let's talk about textures. You know, shiny purple does not give off the same vibe as fuzzy purple. Okay? They, we associate different ideas and moods and concepts to shiny things as we do fuzzy things. And so go back to your visual research and explore textures. Don't automatically think like, oh, I'm going to sew rocks on top of fabric when you see an image like this. And don't automatically think, you know, it puts its lotion on its skin or it gets the hose again when you see an image like this. We are not Hannibal Lecter. Just because I'm obsessed with chicken scales doesn't mean I'm literally going to use scaly leather to create this texture. I'm finding these images that I find inspiring, like this rough hair and the pony skin to get inspired to think about textures and not just lift the images exactly. So pull images from your visual research for images where the textures are really cool. Like look at these chicken scales. I don't literally have to get a scaly leather like alligator to you know reference back to this. Maybe I see this and I find a really strange irregular beading pattern. Maybe I'm looking at this and I'm going to quilt a bunch of stuff in this irregular pattern. And so I'm drawing these, these patterns and everything is going to be quilted. And so this is all going to be top stitching, you know, and there's my light source. And so it's all going to be shadowed. These are all going to be little 3D pieces of quilting. You can go source really irregular looking beads like those kinds of pearls that are not round and perfectly symmetrical okay and start beading with that instead i mean i've seen dresses where the whole thing was beaded in small children's toys you know what if it was a series of asymmetrical appliques or maybe i was doing some interesting embroidery and instead of literally making feathers Okay. Maybe I am hand painting, you know, feathery strokes across my fabric to create a visual texture. With something like this, I'm not thinking about it as skin, but how I can create this effect in fabric. So maybe I'm doing lots of rows of tucking, some kind of hidden smocking with stitches running through it like this, you know. Maybe I'm doing a lot of curving pleats. So what I would do is I would take your image, you know, I would trim it, 
put it in, and then I would leave a blank page on the opposite side so that I can play with different options on how to develop this texture in a not literal way. So, you know, make your notes here, quilting powder, embroidery, you know, hand painting, and so play with textures. And right now it's not about, I'm gonna use this fabric to quilt it and everything is gonna be this size or whatever, but just exploring ways that you can turn in these vague concepts into less vague concepts, right? The whole design process is to take these vague mood inspiration concepts and then make things more and more specific at every step. And then go take a piece of cheap fabric like muslin or organza or whatever and start playing with it. But, you know, get messy. Remember, sketchbook development is all about a series of brainstorming sessions. And brainstorming sessions aren't about, oh, let me think in advance whether this idea is good or not. It's about getting it down, playing around with it, and then just getting down all the ideas that you can. And then later on, coming in and editing. Okay? So throw all the ideas on and then edit. Throw all the ideas down and then edit some more. The, some of the best sketchbooks that I've seen, the first few pages make zero sense at all. And then as you flip through the pages, you're starting to sense a theme, how they're coming together and they're editing themselves and they're like, oh yeah, this is the direction I'm going in. Same with the colors. You have colors, you have some ideas, you know, and some of the color stories are not working. And then they take out like two colors and add another one. And you're like, oh, oh yeah, that's the one. Okay. So put them all down. Okay. Just don't even think about, oh, that's a bad idea. Let's just throw them all down. And then later on you can edit, look, relook, all that good stuff. That's it for today. I'm sure that that's plenty of food for thought for you guys. I will be back in a few weeks with design process video four, all about fabrics. In the meanwhile, go practice. I'll have other videos. I just uploaded one on how to render with marker refill ink. So go check that one out and uh, I will see you next time.